Yo, so guys, welcome back to another reaction, and this is a video of me reacting to the insane engineering of the SR71 um, Blackbird. I've done a reaction to the, was the A10 Warthog. Yeah. I got memed in the comments. I was thinking, wait, is that how you say it? I got memed in the comments how I pronounced it. <laughs> Look, I don't know. I've just sort of, uh, I mean, it sort of shows how unaware of this stuff I really am that I don't even know how to pronounce some of these things. Um... And I mean, this is on the SR71 Blackbird. And I mean, the, the Insane Engineering video that I saw before was quite a good, well put together video, teaching me how it's sort of made, etc. Maybe it's going to be sort of um, a thing that I react to more on this channel, depending on what other videos there are from this channel on this topic. But let me know in the comments what you want me to see next. And I mean, yeah, we're just going to check this out. I mean, from the thumbnail, I feel like I do know of this plane. I don't know the details. I don't know much about it, but I just feel like I've seen it before. We're going to check it out, hopefully going to enjoy. Links are in the description to my new channel if you want to subscribe to that. Same for my second channel. Not my second channel. Same for my Patreon if you're interested in that. Um, but let's jump into this. It's hard to explain the engineering marvel that is the SR-71 yeah. Black... Maybe I'm getting get confused with another one, but this, it just... It does ring a bell. It looks crazy A long-range plane capable of flying 26 kilometers above the surface of the planet. Mm -hmm. So high that the pilots could see the curvature of the planet and the inky black of space from Holy their cockpits. Shit. It flew so fast that the engineers had to develop entirely new materials and designs to mitigate and dissipate the heat generated from aerodynamic friction. What? Entirely unique engines were needed to function from zero all the way up to Mach 3.2, dealing with the myriad of problems like cooling, fuel efficiency, and supersonic shockwaves interfering with airflow. A plane so advanced that when it detected a surface-to-air missile, its response was simply to change course and speed up. <laughs> Even though the missiles had a higher top speed, they couldn't achieve the range and high-altitude maneuverability the Blackbird could. This allowed the... So it literally just dodges, it just flies away from the missiles. So that's kind of different to the, the Warthog. Um in terms of that sort of could withstand certain bits of damage. I guess this is one of those ones that just sort of diverts in and out of sort of the range of the shooting, etc. For 71 to run hundreds of missions through Vietnam, North Korea and Iraq without ever losing an aircraft to enemy fire, despite what? multiple attempts. The entire plane was built around the propulsion system, which alone was a miracle of engineering design. For one, no turbine-driven jet engine can operate with supersonic flow at its inlet. Yet, this plane was powered by the Pratt & Whitney J58 turbojet engine. But get this, off the shelf, these engines could only provide 17.6% of the thrust required for Mach 3.2 flight, a speed which the SR-71 could cruise at for extended periods of time. How on earth did it manage that? In order to achieve those kinds of speeds, a ramjet is typically needed. A ramjet, as you can probably guess from the name, relies... The what? I'm getting confused. I'm just thinking to myself, I keep pronouncing it wrong. The... No, it is the war... It is the warthog. Oh, am I th I'm, I'm getting confused now. I always get confused between how to pronounce certain things. It is that though, so I am saying it right. It's typically needed. A ramjet, as you can probably guess from the name, relies on ram pressure to operate. Ram pressure is simply the pressure that occurs as a plane rams itself through the air. So, as the engine moves through the sky, it funnels this high pressure air inside. Before entering the combustion chamber, the supersonic airflow must be first slowed down. This basically acts like the compressor stage of a normal jet engine, elevating the air pressure before it enters the combustion chamber. Once the air enters the combustion chamber, it is mixed with fuel and ignited. It expands and accelerates once again out of the exit nozzle. With no moving parts, this type of engine is capable of flying at speeds far greater than a typical turbine-driven engine. But it cannot start from zero. It needs forward movement in order to achieve the correct compression of air in the combustion chamber. So they are either dropped from a conventional plane have a secondary what wait 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 what so this is a bigger like just a bigger plane dropping off chamber so they are either dropped from a conventional plane have a secondary propulsion system or 
are a hybrid of a conventional jet engine and a ramjet, what which is precisely fuck? what the SR-71 used. The turbojet J58 engine of the SR-71 is nestled inside the nacelle here. In front and around the J58 is a complicated system of airflow management. These control mechanisms allow the propulsion system to transition from a primarily turbojet engine to a ramjet engine in mid-flight. First, the inlet spike. It is capable of moving forward and back by 0.66 meters. This adjusts the inlet and throat area, which controls the airflow entering the engine. It also keeps the position of the normal shockwave at its ideal position between the inlet throat and the compressor. This is the most efficient position for the shockwave, as it minimizes the energy lost due to drag as air flows over the shockwave. Okay. The inlet spike stays in the forward position until Mach 1.6 after- Look badass as well. Looks like it's like a- just something to defend it, even though it's not what that's for. It just looks, makes it look even like, even scarier if you're obviously fighting against it or just like, just more badass if you're flying in it. At this point, it begins to move backwards by 41 millimeters for every 0.1 increase in Mach number. What? Keeping the shockwave Technology in its ideal wild, position. Man. The inlet spike contains perforations, which connect to the outside of the nacelle through ducts. Initially, the airflow will come from the outside in to provide additional airflow to the turbojet engines. But once the plane hits about Mach 0.5, this airflow reverses. As the plane speeds up, the inlet spike develops a significant boundary layer of air. A boundary layer is a layer of very slow moving air that clings to the surface of objects. By bleeding this layer of slow moving air off the inlet spike, it frees up a greater area of the inlet area for high energy, fast moving air, and thus improves efficiency. Around the engine, there is a bypass area which takes air from the inlet and bypasses it around the J58 Seems engine. True. This air wow. was used to cool the J58, which again improved engine efficiency and allowed the plane to fly faster. After the air passes the engine, it rejoins the airflow just after the engine afterburner, adding additional thrust as more oxygen becomes available for combustion That's insane, and increases man. the pressure through the how ejector. How do you even make stuff to do it? Like, how do you create something? How does, a, how, how does an engineer know how to do this stuff? I guess it's just stuff that's taught through generations and like they learn it through mistakes and stuff. But like, it blows my mind that an engineer will know this kind of thing and there's technology that can do this kind of thing. Nozzle. Air got into this bypass area in a number of ways. There was a shock trap, otherwise known as the cowl bleed, located here, which again helped minimize boundary layer growth. There were suck in doors, located here, which only opened from Mach 0 to Mach 0 0.5 to add additional air to the bypass for engine cooling. Air from the aft bypass doors, located just before the J58 engine, also fed into the bypass. These, together with the forward bypass doors, which vented to the atmosphere, were used to control the pressure level in the inlet at the optimum level. If it was getting too high, a pressure sensor would trigger the forward bypass doors to open, allowing more air to exit the inlet, while the aft bypass doors were controlled by the pilot. These doors played a critical role in maintaining the position of the normal shock wave. If this was mismanaged, the engine would lose control of the normal shockwave and may even spit it out of the intake, resulting in a sudden power loss called an unstart, which would cause the plane to violently yaw in the direction of the faulty engine. If this happened, the forward bypass doors would open fully and the spike would move to the forward position to reduce back pressure and get the shockwave <sighs> back into its normal position. Besides this bypass area that took air from the inlet and dumped it into the ejector, there were also six bypass ducts that took air from the compressor and dumped it directly into the afterburner. These ducts were the primary mechanism that transformed the engine from a turbojet into a ramjet. Afterburners are great. They significantly add to thrust without needing a whole lot of additional weight. They basically just inject fuel into the exhaust of the jet engine and ignite it with whatever oxygen is left to provide additional expansion and therefore thrust. But 
they are really inefficient. However, as the speed increases, they are the only feasible way to generate thrust and they do gain efficiency thanks to the forward motion providing the compression of air needed to run them, instead of the turbine needing to be powered to turn the compressor stage. The crazy thing about the SR71 is that the engineers could have eked out more thrust from this engine to increase the top speed even more. Ramjets can go up to Mach 5, so why did they stop at 3.2? Would they have run out of fuel? Fuel efficiency in terms of cost doesn't mean a whole lot to a military plane like this. The military doesn't care about cost, but the more fuel you carry, the heavier and bigger the plane. So this is when they f they f like the fuel the fuel tankers or the fuel planes re are refueling in air in the air. I've never seen this before, but that's insane, bro. Like imagine having to line it up and everything. Gets, increasing the fuel <laughs> it uses. There is a break-even point, and the plane's range will be limited. But the engineers did manage to fill the plane up with an astounding amount of fuel with some clever engineering. The plane was strictly a surveillance plane, so no internal volume was used for weapons, freeing up space for fuel. You have probably heard that the SR-71 leaks fuel on the runway because there were gaps in the fuselage, but that's a simple fact that ignores much of the engineering that caused it. The SR-71 used something called a total wet wing fuel tank system, which meant that the fuel was not contained within a separate fuel bladder. This was a weight-saving measure. Separate metal fuel tanks would add too much weight, and lighter plastic ones would melt from the intense heat generated from the aerodynamic friction. So, the fuel was contained by the skin of the plane itself. The engineers applied sealant to every gap the fuel could possibly come out of, but because the titanium skin of the plane expanded and contracted with every flight, it gradually deteriorated over time allowing the fuel to leak out. Because oh of this, the SR-71 had to regularly go into maintenance and have sealant reapplied, but it usually came back still leaking, just not quite as much. The number of man-hours required to reduce it to zero was simply too great to fit it between flights, so they just had an allowable fuel leak limit which looked like this. This plane, like a- An allowable fuel, fuel leaks by a minute, what? Allowable. That sounds a bit risky. <laughs> I mean, I guess, it, was there any situations where maybe it's been recorded where the fuel leaking led to something exploding or what, or setting fire with this plane? So I swear, any small amounts of fuel leaking will be dangerous in a plane like this especially. The fuel leak limit, which looked like this. This plane, like Who a like rocket, was mostly fuel. Its dry weight, That's depending nuts, on man. sensor payload, was between 25 and 27 tons. Its wet weight was between 61 and 63 tons, making what? it, by weight, 59% fuel to feed those hungry engines. What the Even fuck? Then, without the ability <laughs> to refuel in the air, this plane would have had terrible range for what was supposed to be a long-range spy plane. Range varied greatly. For example, the engines became significantly less efficient when the outside temperature was higher. A fully loaded SR-71 could expect to burn nearly 13 metric tons of fuel accelerating from Mach 1.25 at 30,000 feet to Mach 3 at 70,000 feet if the outside temperature was 10 degrees Celsius above standard. That is 36% of its fuel capacity. If it was 10 degrees below standard, the fuel burn nearly halved to 7.2 tons. Jeez. And of course, the range was severely affected by their speed and use of the afterburner. But on average, the SR-71 had a range of about 5,200 kilometers. About enough- I mean, to me, that sounds like a lot, but again, in terms of like, the grand scheme of things of how it's surveillance, plane and stuff, maybe that's not actually a lot, like he's saying. But like, it still sounds like a decent distance, I just assume it's not as good as maybe it should be when it's said it's a long distance um, traveling plane or whatever. For a one-way trip from New York to London, not terribly I mean, useful. The US was not going to be landing at their target to hand over a top secret plane to the enemy. Yeah. However, with aerial refueling, the plane could stay in the air more or less indefinitely provided there was no mechanical issues. 
Really, the range was entirely determined by the pilots. The longest operational sortie occurred in 1987 when the US flew the SR-71 from Okinawa to observe developments in the Iran-Iraq war. This mission lasted 11.2 hours and likely required at least five aerial refuelings along the way. So Jeez. if it wasn't the fuel or engines that limited the SR-71's top speed, what did? At Mach 3.2, the nose of the SR-71 reached 300 degrees Celsius, while the engine nacelles could reach 306 at the front and what? 649 at the back. Oh, this is what please. truly limited the top speed of the SR-71. Without careful material selection and design, the plane would simply overheat and fail. This Even the very fuel inefficient. needed to be specially formulated to get around these overheating issues. It was a specially formulated fuel called JP-7, which has very low volatility and a high flash point. This was partially needed because the fuel leaked on the runway and they needed a fuel that wouldn't ignite or easily evaporate okay, and make the ground crew. That answers my question then about how has there been cases where there's been like fires or explosions because of the fuel Ill, leaking. But mostly they needed a fuel that wouldn't vaporize in the tanks and cause fuel feed and pressurization problems. The JP-7 fuel was so stable that it actually doubled as a coolant for the entire plane. The fuel was pumped around the airframe to cool critical components like the engine oil, hydraulic Holy systems, shit. and control electronics. You're, f you're, you're cooling it down using fuel. That sounds like, that doesn't even sound possible, but I guess it's, I mean, it obviously is, but that sounds like such a weird way to do it, but also a really smart way to sort of think about how to combat the issues that you have. Cooling it down with fuel. When the fuel got too hot, it was simply sent to the engines for combustion. The fuel what? was so stable that the plane actually needed to carry shots of triethyl boring, a fuel that spontaneously ignites in the presence of oxygen to start the combustion cycle and after burners. The plane usually only carried about 16 shots of this, so the pilots needed to manage them carefully, particularly when slowing down for refueling and managing unstarts. One huge question I had about the SR-71 was why it was painted black. Airliners are all white to reflect heat and prevent the plane from overheating. Yeah, it makes it hot. If that applies to an airliner, why not the SR-71? The SR-71's predecessors were unpainted, which saved weight, and the areas exposed to highest temperatures were painted black. Why was this? Surely black would absorb more heat. The Concorde was once painted blue for a Pepsi ad campaign, and had to lower its speed as it absorbed too much heat from the sun. However, the Concorde did not fly nearly as plane. high or as fast as the SR-71, and as the SR-71 rose, the energy it absorbed from the sun dwindled in comparison to the heat it gained from aerodynamic friction. For this, we have to refer to something called Kirchhoff's Rule of Radiation, which tells us that a good heat absorber, like a black object, is also an equally effective heat emitter. So the black paint helped the SR-71 radiate heat away from the plane, as it allowed the plane to radiate more heat than it gained from the radiation from the sun. These efforts helped to keep the plane cool, but the structure of the plane still needed to be incredibly heat stable. Aluminium is typically the material aircraft engineers turn to. It was used for the Concorde, but as we saw, it too had its speed limited by heat to a much lower Mach 2. Aluminium is cheap, has a great strength to weight ratio, and is easily machinable. Titanium, the material that made up 93% of the SR-71, has only one of these properties. Its strength to weight ratio, otherwise known as specific strength, is fantastic. But titanium is incredibly expensive, despite it being the seventh most common metal in Earth's crust. What? The refinement process. I guess maybe because it's just so. Wait, is, wait, wait. Titanium's the seventh most expensive. No, it's the most expensive. Or well, it's expensive, even though it's the seventh most common. Why would that be? Because it's good. Because it's like good at what it's used for. Like, 
or it's used a lot. It's just needed a lot. The supply and demand is very high. Or the demand's very Despite high. Despite it being the seventh most common metal, titanium is incredibly expensive. Despite it being the seventh most common metal in Earth's crust, the refinement process is incredibly long and requires expensive consumables. Okay, so it takes a long it's time also to not process. easily machinable as it readily reacts with air when welding or forging, becoming okay. brittle. For these reasons, titanium is rarely used in structural parts in aviation. However, the real benefit of titanium is its ability to resist heat. The reasons for this are complex that we will explore in depth in future. However, the gist is that titanium alloys have incredibly strong bonding within its crystal lattice that resist heat from breaking them apart. Titanium alloys can resist temperatures up to 600 degrees Celsius Jeez. before their atoms begin to diffuse and slide over each other significantly, allowing it to retain much of its strength even at 300 degrees. Wow. It has also very low thermal expansion, so that expansion and contraction we mentioned earlier is minimized, reducing the thermal stresses in the aircraft. But titanium has its limits, and for the SR-71, this was about 3.2 Mach. Today, engineers have made huge strides in material science. The SR-71 used heat-resistant composite materials as radar-absorbing wedges between the structural frame located in these locations. The manufacturing techniques needed to make composite materials as load-bearing structures did not yet exist, but that has changed. The SR-71 successor, the SR-72, which is now in development, will take advantage of new high performance composites, that one out, which will man. allow it to reach speeds up to Mach 6. <laughs> Many of its engine components will likely be 3D printed titanium with cooling ducts printed right into the part. And I read 3D printed titanium, bro. Technology is going crazy. 10 years time, man. 20 years time, 30 years time. I cannot imagine the engineering levels of like these kinds of um, planes and just. Engineering in general, it's scary, man. It's so scary. 3D print, 3D printers, bro. They are the, they are now, but they're also the future. Like they're crazy. Like, I swear they only started really like being used. Like I, I first started hearing about them like five, six years ago. Obviously, they've been like longer than that, but like I guess they're still quite in their early stages of their development. So in 10, 20 years time, imagine what 3D printers can print, man. Oh, now nah, it's crazy. 3D printed titanium with cooling ducts printed right into the part. Holy its shit, range man. also won't be determined by pilots as it will be an autonomous drone. The what? insane engineering that makes planes like this possible fascinates me and I recently watched an excellent documentary on Curiosity Stream that details the there build process for And he's getting his money. He deserves it. The world's largest airliner, the A380, chronicling the massive sheet metal cutting machines that cut the aluminium skin, the vacuum moulds that form it, and the biggest <laughs> oven in Britain that locks the shape in place. This is just one step in the process, and the documentary is nearly an hour long. This is just one of thousands of documentaries. I might actually check that out. That sounds really interesting. Um, obviously, if you're interested in that, links are all here. Get in his money. You'll love to see it. Let's not forget the insane engineering from is from the 50s. That's what I was thinking, bro. This plane does not look like it's from... I heard him say it was used in the Vietnam, like when Vietnam and the US were at war. It it looked way ahead of its time, like in terms of the how it looked and how. Imagine seeing that flying over you in like the sixties, the fifties, or whatever. That that must blow your mind. You must be like, what the hell? Let's not forget the insane. Um, no, afraid that one. Damn, there's nothing more badass than outflying an attacking missile. <laughs> Just can't catch you, man. Grandpa machine looks very cool. Imagine what the US now has. The plane is 60 years old. Yeah, man, it's crazy. The plane is such a techno technological marvel that it uses its own fuel. Yeah, that's... The, what the fact that it uses, it uses its own fuel to cool itself down. Bro, that doesn't even make sense. It doesn't even make sense. But Well, it does, but it doesn't. Oh, it's crazy. But hopefully you enjoyed this one. Tell me what sort of insane engineering type video, video do you want to see next. Or just any sort of engineering video or military related video just let me know in the comments and i'll try and do it in future but yeah this is one badass plane and i mean the sr72 which again this is two years old nearly two years old so i guess it's maybe been um, it's actually in use now i'm not sure but maybe there's a video on that let me know in the comments but until next time like subscribe and peace